board. So we're going to be once again in Africa, and we're going to be focusing focusing on characteristics of power. And so we'll be focusing on function and appearance, location, as well as technique. So how those things influence the idea of power. So we're moving into Ghana. And so we are in the area of this ivory gold coast on Western, in Western Africa. And this is where most of our imagery comes from. Um, this is a very wealthy region of Africa. And so, like I said, many of our artworks come from different cultures, different people, but they're coming from this region. Okay, so for power imagery, right, we have the Sika Dwa Kofi or the golden stool. And so when you look at this, this is one of the contextual images that you're given. How is this more than just a stool, right? Um, how is this stool kind of special? And so we're gonna focus on that. This comes from the Ashanti kingdom in Western Africa in the area that we know of today is Ghana. This um, Ashanti uh, kingdom was founded in the 17th century by King Osei Tutu I. Um, he had the help of a very powerful priest and supposedly this stool, right? This stool was conjured up and came from the sky. So supposedly it fell from the heavens to the earth and supposedly landed on the lap of this king. And so there is a very mystical sort of story that comes about from this. And the function of the stool is it is the soul of the nation, right? So it embodies and represents the all of the Ashante people, right? So the function of it is very different than what we normally assume. You have a stool, right? You think it's gonna be something to sit upon, but no one, no one sits on the golden stool, right? So, this is your image of the golden stool. And let's just look at it for a moment. Is there anything odd about this stool? Anything that kind of like, just by looking at it, kind of strikes you as kind of odd? Anything? How would I sit on this? Could you sit on this? get a bunch of no's, right? You can't sit on it. This is actually sitting on its side. So this part right here with this handle, that's actually where the bottom would rest. So this stool actually sits on its own chair, right? It sits on its own chair and it's always displayed on its side. That helps it so that no one can ever sit on it. So it's on its own chair, it's on its own throne, it's on its side. And it comes with two brass and one gold bell. So people can hear it coming. So when it's transported, these golden and, and brass bells announce its arrival. And then it has these four little images. Can you see these four people in between the bells, right? Those represent defeated enemies. Right. So the golden stool um, is made out of gold. It's covered in gold. And um, here's like a little recreation of it. In this region of Ghana, um, as well as kind of in Western Africa, there is a tradition of wood carving. And so you're going to see that most of the imagery that we have is carved out of wood. And so these stools are very, very common. Um, there's a rich traditional history with them. Um, some of the oldest ones don't exist anymore because they're made out of wood. They deteriorate with age and use. Um, they break. But you can see that they come in all different styles. Um, like I said, most of them are made out of wood. Some of them are covered in gold. But this one in particular is very special in that it's covered. It is gold, right? This golden stool. And that you never, ever sit in it. But these examples kind of show you what they look like, right? So here is the contextual image besides the 
image of the stool on how it is displayed. So AP gave you this image as well. Notice that the stool is sitting by an important person. Who do you think this person is here in the center? Who do you think? Eva, do you have an educated guess for me? Uh, their ruler or leader. Right, and it sits side by side. This stool sits side by side because this is not a stool for the king, right? This is the soul of the people. So the soul of the people gets to sit at the side of the king, right? And so it shows the power and prestige of this object and how important the, the soul of the people are to them, right? And so um, not the king, no one, no one um, sits on this. And so when the stool arrives, notice that it's carried on the back of people. And notice, if we look at this image, especially on the right side, notice how the man is wearing white. And at no time is that stool supposed to really touch a person. It might look like it's hitting his head a little bit in the back, but it's not supposed to really touch. So kind of like when we saw the Sufi cleric um, getting the book to Jafar, Jafar remember? right? He's getting that illumination when we looked at um, uh, Islamic miniatures, right? It, he, it's so special that people don't even touch this stool, right? So it's carried on the back and there's always fabric kind of in between so the person isn't physically touching it, right? So interesting, right? How, is the, how are the British tied to the history of the golden stool? What do you think? What do you think a British colonial wanted to do when they came to visit? It's a stool, right? Their guests, they think, I want to sit on the stool. And if you go to Smart History, there is an article, um, a video, I should say, on this object. And they talk about all different kinds of golden objects and whatnot. And so basically, a, you can watch it. I don't think we're gonna take the time today. Um, but a British diplomat, right, he's coming in, right, and he's really upset that they didn't let him sit on it, right, and so he thought it, they were being rude. He did not realize that no one sat on it, not the king, not the queen, not, not a priest, no one in Ashanti uh, culture sits on it, and this was something that was taken and stolen from the Ashanti people by the British, and they hid it, and they did find it. So there's actually this queen who led a rebellion to get it back. And so it was in hiding for many, many years um, to stay out of the sight of the colonials. Okay, any questions on the golden stool? Okay, the last power imagery, or actually we have another one too, but um, part of 90, um, is coming from Central. So we're in the area of the Democratic Republic of Congo. I think it actually has another name now, um, if I should check that out. Um, and we're gonna be looking at the Kuba people. The Kuba people are a collective of people who live in a region between two rivers. So it's, it's gonna be like a bunch of different um, you know, cities in this area. And these people um, live in, the, in a similar area um, and have the same leader. And it's this Nyim, N-Y-I-M. And all of the history that we know about the Kuba people comes from their artifacts, artifacts as well as a oral tradition. So there's no written right, history of, of these people. And the artists, right, the artists um, were professionals. So they had to, you know, they were exclusive. They either worked in wood or they were blacksmiths or weavers, weavers, and they worked for the ruler. So they worked for the Nyan. Um, we know that these artists um, became apprentices and they learned their craft from a master craftsperson. So these traditions were passed on through the generations. So we can see a lot of um, similarities in their styles. And we don't really know the name of individual artists um, because like oral traditions, those things are kind of just passed along. So here is the example that we have. 
and it's called a nadap. It's a portrait figure of King Mishi Mishang Mush, Mushbol. So I apologize for butchering that. Um, but this is one of many examples of the, these nadaps, these portrait figures, right? So let's look at him really, like let's kind of scrutinize, scrutinize him just a little bit. Let's look at his face. How would you describe his face? What does he appear to be doing? Brianna, what do you think? He looks very relaxed. He does. He looks very cool, calm, collected. He even looks like he's got his eyes closed in a way. So he's a king and he's shown very cool, calm, and collected. And he appears to be sitting, right? He appears to be sitting and he's holding something here, right? Um, kind of on his lap. When you look at his proportions, would you say that this is a realistic proportions of the human body? Would you say that this is realistic? No. These figures are about three heads tall, right? He's seated too, but the, about a third of it is typically their heads. Then their bodies are about as big as their heads. And then the chair or the seat that they're sitting on is the last third. And so it's not particularly realistic in proportion, and it's not probably very realistic in detail either, right? So these nadaps represent the ideals of the king, but not really a representation of the actual king, right? These are symbolic representations, okay? So this is not exactly what he probably looked like. And we know this because there's a lot of different examples of these. Where are they? There we go. See, all right, a bunch of different examples of them. And they are all kind of sitting in similar postures. They have similar headdresses on. They have similar expressions on their face. Notice that they're all kind of cool, calm, and collected. Now, we know that this is King Mishi, right? We know this is King Mishi because of what he's holding. See this thing right here, right? This tells us who it is. So they are all holding an eyeball, I-B-O-L, right? Eyeball, that's a vocabulary term that you need to know for these Nadat figures. So these objects represent the man. They symbolize what the man is known for. So if he's a master carver, he'd have his carving tools or his objects. If he's a musician, he might hold a drum. If he was a writer, he would write some, you know, have some writing instruments. If he was a warrior, he'd have a weapon, right? So these objects help us identify which ruler they are. And those objects, right, are passed down through the oral tradition rather than written record, right? So his identifier is that he has a severed hand and a drum. So King Mishi was missing a hand. And so notice he's missing a hand here. And then he has a drum. And of course, what's on the drum? His hand, right? And so that's how we know it's this particular king. right? So how is power conveyed, right? How is power conveyed, right? What do you think? What are some conventions of power that we have here? Right? He's got the cool, calm, collected face, right? He's very stoic, right? He's very stiff, right? And then of course he's holding the, the eyeball, right? He's holding that identifier of his power. So they included a contextual image with this. And this one's really difficult to be able to um, kind of see the connection with it because our, um, 
image, he's not really wearing a lot of regalia, right? He's got this like platform headdress and he's bare chested, but this is actually what the ruler normally looks like. So normally he's wearing really heavy ceremonial attire. It's covered in cowrie shells. He's got armbands, he's got beads, um, he's got feathers, he's got all kinds of royal um, regalia. And this is the, all the things that kind of represent his power. And this guy, this little Nadat figure is kind of his double spirit. It stands in for him when he's not present. So he's there to represent the king when the king is elsewhere, right? It's kept in his royal shrine, right? And around it, it has all these royal charms around it to kind of pr protect it around him. So this double spirit is always protected by the people through charms, through singing and dance, through um, keeping it in a special shrine. Oh, look there. I, I should have added this to the other slide. This royal regalia weighs over 150 pounds. So you can see not your normal everyday attire. Okay. So let me just check the time here real fast. It looks like we're doing good. We have one more power image that we can do for today. And then we will move on. Or then I'll let you go. So we are in Western Africa again. Right. And so we, if we look at like African masks, there's kind of like stereotypes of what those look like. Right. And so here's a bunch of different African masks from a bunch of different regions. And so what I wanted to do was to kind of show you a few examples before we get to our image today. Um, what are some common stereotypes that we see for different African masks? Are they realistic? Would you say they're realistic? No, they often are symmetrical, right? They have a line go down the center. They're normally the same on both sides. Um, they're often geometric. So sometimes the shapes of like a nose is rather a geometric shape rather than realistic. Um, they are mostly simplified and abstracted. They often have large eyes, a pronounced brow, a geometric nose. Often they have scarification. We'll be able to see some examples of that, not today, but um, tomorrow. We'll see some examples with scarification included in them. So that's the intentional um, breaking of the skin in a design. It's kind of similar to a tattoo, with, but without the ink. And then they often have elaborate headdresses or feathers or um, regalia kind of around the head. So this is an example from the end, which is where we're gonna to be today. Would you say that this is realistic or abstract? What do you think? Jeffrey, what do you think? Realistic or abstract? Does this look like the other ones we saw? Uh, no, this one looks more realistic. Right. And so I really wanted to kind of think about stereotypes. This is kind of the stereotype. When we go to a, a history museum, we often see these very abstracted images, but it doesn't mean that there doesn't exist very realistic images. And some of them come from being, um, and so this comes from the Yoruba people of Nigeria and the um, MBN, and they are images of the FA, which is the ruler. And so they are very, very realistic in proportion and in detail. And some of them have elaborate scarification. So you see all those parallel lines that kind of follow the contours of the face. That's supposed to be um, scarification that's on his face, right? And so after um, the Ruba, there's actually a tradition of these um, lost wax bron um, bronze heads. And so um, there's many different examples of these. Some of them are a little bit more abstract than what we just saw. Um, here, you know, it's got a little bit more simplified eyes, but 
we look at them, there's a lot of similarities, right? Notice how they have the coils around the neck. They kind of have the woven headdress. They have kind of those simplified stylized eyes. And they're often accompanied by other imagery. What is coming out of the head of these masks or these figure portraits? What's coming out the top? What is that? Elephant tusk. Right. And so elephant tusks, think about an elephant. They convey a lot of power. They're wise, right? Um, they are majestic. They're large, right? Um, and so they're often accompanied with these large ivory tusks coming out the heads. And they're often used on podiums. So here you can see they're kind of like elevated uh, on these podiums, right? This one is actually not a mask. This is, goes on the belt. So this is actually worn on the hip. And this is a portrait of um, the, the queen mother. And there's different examples of them. So some of these are coming from the same people are more realistic. So there's a tradition of stylized and realistic imagery, right? And so the reason I bring that up is that there is a bronze plaque in your 250 by the same people. And so um, a lot of these, plaques ended up in the British Museum. Why do you think they're in the British Museum? Erin, any idea why they're in the British Museum? Uh, these countries were colonized by the British. Mm -hmm. So they Oh, here, here's our image. So I'll show you a contextual image in a second. So 169 is the wall plaque from the Oba's palace of the Edo people from Nigeria. And so this region um, controlled a lot of the slave trade of Africa. Um, and so they gained a lot of their own power by selling other people. So they didn't sell their own people, they sold other people um, to the British and to other, you know, to the French and to other slaving um, nations. And so in 1897, a British um, group came in and they raided um, the Oboe's um, uh, palace and stole all of these plaques and took them back to England. And so they took a large quantity of them. And most of them are at the British Museum in London like many other things. So here is a series of them. Now we do not know the order of them, right? The British did not take good records. They kind of just raided it, took them all and um, put them on display in their museums. And so they were originally placed in the Oba's palace. And supposedly they were added to peers in the atrium. So before you walked into like the throne room, you would be confronted by basically the history of the different reigns of these rulers, right? And they were probably in, in um, order of lineage. So we would be able to see like the royal family, you'd be able to see the chronological order of their rulers. But today it's all mishmashed at the British Museum. So who are all these people? Who do you think the ruler is in this image? The guy in the center. Right, the guy in the center. And so the, the Oba is normally displayed with his attendants and his attendants had a system of hierarchy as well. So the people who are the most important are typically shown large and then the lesser important attendants were shown smaller. I mean, look at the little guys in the background, right? They're super tiny at the very top, right? And then the Oba is in the middle and notice he's on horseback. Can you guys see that he's on a horse, right? And he's large. So this image tells us who each other is based on heriactic scale. So he's wearing the typical regalia of the Obas. They, he wears coral, right, on his neck and on his headdress. He's holding, he's on a horseback and then his fan bearers are protecting him from the hot sun, right? So we think that this is Oba, S-A-G, 
from 1504. And the reason we think it is him is he was the first king to ride by horseback. So that horse is actually important in us understanding who we think this was. Okay, so here's the contextual image here. This is normally what the oba looks like. Notice that he's wearing coral. The coral actually comes from the Portuguese and the Portuguese were traders in this area and they would bring coral and traded it for things like pepper cloth, um, beads, and the, the people would give um, brass and horses. So they were uh, giving a give and take. And so some of these bronze figures actually have some European characteristics on them as well to denote the people who were coming to trade. So there's actually images that are of non-Western um, non African people in these images too, right? So these were made by the lost wax process. So these are made out of bronze and they have a series of high and low relief. So um, I'll leave you guys with this at the end. So notice that some of it's much more sculptural and 3D. And then as it moves into the distance, it becomes more shallow, right? And they made this using the lost wax process, just like we saw with the ancient Greeks, right? So they would make a mold, then they would fill it with wax, heat the wax out, and then they would pour the molten metal in the cavity, okay? So I will see you guys tomorrow, right? Um, if you have any questions on your way,